Wow, was that an applause? Or you are totally lost? Well, anyway, for the next 95 minutes, I have been asked to speak you to death because the remaining of the event means only parting after you have done with me. I'm coming from a Nordic side of the Baltic Sea, and Gdansk is not known area for us because we have always been afraid to be in the areas where there have been kings and other things which have been ruled by power. My role is today actually very simple. I will speak a little bit about the change and changing landscape of the perception of the innovation which we have had. Unfortunately, we have spent too much time to the brilliant young startup companies which lay down the future. However, the every day of innovation means that we all do in public sector, in government, in big companies, in NGOs, also something which might be called innovation. It's about doing things in a new way and making your ideas into reality. That is innovation. And that is why some companies, some nations, some organizations perform better than others. It's driven by innovation. However, in the roots of the innovation, there is something called knowledge, something which we tend to know, but we have not tried that out in practice. The best example for me is a historic example of the third most common element in our mother nature, Earth, which is aluminium and the history of aluminium. Before human being was standing on two foot, the aluminium was there. However, we learned how to use aluminium only a bit more than 100 years ago. It was related only to one thing, the knowledge. The knowledge we have about natural sciences, about the chemistry, about electricity, about the potential use of that particular material. And that is a great story. That story could be any startup story because, as you can see, it just blows. It just blows out. Any startup would imagine that. And aluminium has been a great startup for 150 years already. And the story continues and continues, continues. And the cumulative competence and knowledge we put on top generation after generation on the research and science is actually the one which is driving us further. So the knowledge we have actually is laying down the opportunity to do something meaningful. That meaningful means and capacity we have, a capacity to act. Random activity is not driving you towards a meaningful innovation. There are many, many definitions for the innovation, but the innovation actually should mean for us that we practice knowledge we have. We, we try, we fail, we try once again, we fail, but what we accumulate throughout the process is a knowledge of not doing things in a way that drives us towards a failure, but drives us towards a success. The idea we are going to implement does not need necessarily to be actually a breakthrough science idea. It can be already somebody else's idea. And this is what we can witness right now, not only throughout the companies which presented today, but in a broader sense in economies around the world. We take an idea of somebody else's idea and we put it to the new context of a new problem on a totally different country, on a totally different user segment and a totally different regulatory environment. And also probably you can put it to the totally different economic sector. For example, the biggest data companies nowadays are no longer IT companies or telecoms or pharmacy companies, but they become an electricity companies who turn 
their noise through the wires into a meaningful data about the consumer products which are connected to the electricity grid. So there is everywhere a piece of competence and knowledge which could be reused and re-executed. What we have learned very recently is how to create and extract digital information. Yes, you all know that throughout the last two years, we have created as much digital information as mankind throughout its history has generated. And, and that information is not in hands of the government, is not stored in one big data server, but is widespread around the world. The data is actually the crude oil of the 21st century. And more and more organizations learn how to dig that crude oil. But very few have tools to make that crude oil into a useful product. And this is one of the biggest challenges for the innovation what we see right now. Remember that picture. It's the same place, same square in Vatican, but less than 10 years later, the same square in the anticipation of the similar announcement looked totally different. There were as many people on the square, as big anticipation on the square. However, the stage looks so different. They all have a device. And if they don't have a device with them, they will be, anyway, leaving throughout the use of services and additional and extra traces of data. In Estonia, we tend to say that officially in the court, if you go and you say that I am in a family relationship, I have a family, then you need to prove it. The best proof of having a relationship is that if your mobile phone is spending a night's next to another mobile phone for more than three months, then you have a relationship. And that's a good proof of having a relationship when two mobile phones spend nights together for a long time period. It has caused also a several troublesome situation where one mobile phone is sometimes spending a night with other mobile phone on a regular basis, and that's, that is called an abuse of the relationship and misbehavior, which is not creating too much trust, not only between the mobile phones, but actually the owners of the mobile phones. That data, which is in hands of the not only mobile operators, but application developers around the world, is becoming more valuable and is one of the reasons why the OTTs over the top service providers have been sometimes valued higher than actually the network owners. The biggest shock, I think, was a couple of years ago in Mobile World Congress in Barcelona, where we recognized that the total value of the application and software service companies which create mobile applications was bigger than the total value of the all telecom companies around the world. How come? How come that app companies, starting from Facebook and Google and ending up with WhatsApp and every other nitty-gritty small piece, are more valuable than the network companies that actually deliver the content and services? And the answer is very simple. They have been able to do something which is making a meaning for the data which is lying on the network. And this is a big difference right now. Successful companies are able to analyze the data, not just produce the data. However, the growth of the data which we produce is growing exponentially, while our ability to analyze the data, make a meaning out of the data, is growing only linearly. So if you have an expertise in some field, 
which is able to make some sort of meaning to at least some sort of data in particular area. Go for it, make your enterprise, and you will be valued much, much higher than the companies which are generating the data. We have had a number of cases already of successful startups who have been acquired or valued higher than the companies which produce the data compared to those who are able to make a meaning and, um, and give a an useful analysis of the data. IT has been often described as a driving force for the innovation. I would like to say that IT is not per se the driver of innovation, but it's a useful catalyst. And the change is not so much driven right now in economies and different sectors by the IT itself, but by the side effects of the IT. The side effects of the IT means that the businesses are more global, they reach faster than users, and also the, one of the biggest dilemmas right now is that due to the fact that IT life cycles on the, on the mar market are getting shorter and shorter and shorter, then the ability of making return on the investment of the IT investments is becoming harder and harder, especially for the big companies. Small companies can take existing brand new from the flesh technology, deliver it, make it useful application. However, the old companies have a legacy system and they are slow in development cycles. IT is giving us right now with its side impacts over two thirds of the economic growth in OECD countries, including countries like Poland. It's an impact of IT, not in telecommunication and not in IT and not in banking, kind of natural sectors of IT, but it's also giving an impact to the trade, to the logistics, to the transport, to the public services, to the agriculture, to the construction building and all other sectors. When we move towards the digitalization, it gives an extra growth, but it also means that the jobs are changing. It creates jobs, new jobs, but most importantly, the old jobs are disappearing. And let me give you a couple of examples of the changing and disappearing jobs. This is a warehouse, very familiar to the Gdansk port area people, very familiar to the Amsterdam, Rotterdam port area people. A usual day in uh, in a warehouse. Go take that piece of parcel, put it over there, and deliver it to somebody. This is a reality of not today, but already a couple of years. This is a way how Amazon is working in the environment where no human beings are allowed because they will mess up with the system. Those robots were not originally designed to take away the jobs from human beings. But they do it much better, much more efficiently. And when you think right now that you go to the Amazon store and click on buy, then the first time the human hand is touching probably the parcel you have just bought is when the last mile is solved. And also, there are many new startups dealing also with the last mile issues to remove the potential harm or, or, or mis-efficiency of the human beings away. Those robots can be reused also to many other purposes. And uh, the way to address the stress, the trade unions, uh, expectations on a good working hours and the working environment is totally different compared to the existing ones. The other example is very good and very simple, and there have been many companies already also today in front of you talking about the problems related to transportation and the ways how to address the transportation. I'm a personally also investing in the company and several other companies which do not 
deal with the full automated ground transportation, but which deals sometimes with a most unconvenient part of the driving. The most unconvenient part of the driving is not the highway or the road which you enjoy and love to drive with your car, but it's a, it's a heavy traffic. It's something where you need to find a parking place in front of the opera and you don't, and the opera starts in five minutes. So the solution where you can go and drive with your car to the opera and leave the car, just get out from the front door, leave the car and say, go and park yourself somewhere and uh, pick me up two and a half hours later when the opera is over. That is really something which is making the most use. And those so-called closed areas for the automated driving, those are the ones which are popping up a city after city, especially in highly urbanized areas. But it would be always good to dream. And yes, we know that the biggest inefficiency in the ground transportation is a human being. And imagine the reality we can create right now is that the traditional rush hour mess with a simple sensors and with a very simple decision-making aid can be totally redesigned into something which is a dream right now. I'm not a believer that something like that will happen in reality in the suburban circle. However, we have already a capacity to deliver a solution like that. And we have a capacity to make many, many other things as well with the help of IT and which impacts many other sectors around the world. So, it's really about making a decision whether you take a blue pill and you continue living with a belief that things don't change, the countries remain, the jobs remain, there will be a career path which takes me to my secure state pension and there will be an always the nice neighborhood which I had and everything remains as it is or you take another pill which requires you to change and to innovate. Be ready for the change. And I always recall a good friend of mine, a former Prime Minister of Finland who is coming every now and then to Tallinn to visit some nice dining places, he says that he's so jealous on Estonians. And I say, why? Why are you jealous? Finland is a welfare state over there. You rank top on all innovation rankings and information society rankings and all R&D rankings and your, 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 your security, social security system is top. And he says that he is jealous only because of one thing. If you ask Estonian, what would you like, what, what is needed to be done in order to make your life better, then people in Estonia say, we need to change something. And change is good, because change makes things better. And when you go to Finland and ask people, what is needed to be done, in order to make things better. People say, nothing is needed to be done. We are, we are happy, we are satisfied. Please don't change everything, nothing. Don't change anything. And the aspiration for the change is actually one of the key ingredients when it comes to the innovation and the ability to adapt with the global trends, both those trends which are ones which give you an opportunity to grow and which are actually also sometimes trends which would kill your business, your jobs, your economy and your aspiration and, and present imagination about your life security. 
ability to accept change, be willing to change and combine it together with a knowledge, with your capacity to act, is a one which is only yours if you wish so. And sorry for the joke in the beginning. 95 minutes is nothing and never what the Estonians speak. I was given 25 minutes and I always remember when I was working and speaking at United Nations General Assembly 15 years ago, advice from my president saying that if you really want to make a point, never use a time which was given to you, but give the time for thinking for people. So this is my tiny, small gift for you, the five minutes of the time which I would otherwise waste it of your life. But now you have it, you own it, and you can use it for something meaningful except listening for me. Thank you once again. All right, thank you very much. You open to a question? I am open to the question. Great, all right. Um, so this is now your time. Anybody who's sitting on a question? Just raise your hand if you have a question. Mm -hmm. All right, there's one right here, uh, down the front. There you go. My question is, um, you told about uh, the analysis gap, but that's my opinion, but uh, I think the, the most problem, the, the, the biggest problem is uh, may, maybe not the biggest, but, but similar is integration of, of data. So you could analyze better if you get uh, access to multiple sources of data. And, and uh, isn't that a problem? My very simple answer is that you can expect and try to standardize and try to integrate and harmonize the different data points on the planet Earth. It will never happen, unfortunately. So on, on the next layer beyond the kind of cruel data, there is a metadata organizations which make a good business out of the fact that they make out of messy digital data some sort of structured data. And then on top of that, there is an expertise. I don't see right now any chance that within the next 10 years time, we would agree on harmonizing the standards between the increasingly big variety of different data points. But I see an increasing number of companies which try to make a metadata structures to make those different data points really analyzable. So that's my short answer. Okay, another question. Just raise your hand. Well, it doesn't seem to be the case. It looks like you cleared everything up. Thank you. So one more time, ladies and gentlemen, let's please give a big round of applause for Lina Avik. Thank you so much. <laughs>